Have you ever dreamed of starting your own podcast? Well, you can. It's simple, it's easy, and best of all, it's free. By going to anchor.fm, you can start your own podcast today and have your own show up and ready to go. Anchor's graphic user interface is user friendly and you get paid for your content by setting up a Stripe account. Go to anchor.fm. Again, that's anchor.fm and start your podcast today. Welcome to the Living Healthy Podcast, where you can improve your quality of life by making solid and informed decisions. I'm your host, Eddie Randall. Thank you for joining me for another information-packed episode of the Living Healthy Podcast. Tonight's podcast is entitled, Acknowledging the Dangers of Per and Polyfluoral Alkyl Substances. Per and Polyfluoral Alkyl Substances, or PFAS, are man-made chemicals that were introduced in the 1940s. These are compounds composed of different variations of carbon and fluorine bonds, and they're not safe. They're used in firefighting foam, raincoats, water repellent materials, stain resistant carpets, furniture, furniture polish, wood floor polish, household cleaners, and car products like car wax. They're also found in personal care products like sunscreen, dental floss, water resistant mascara, and lipstick. The electronegativity of the fluorine makes this bond extremely durable resulting in PFAS being resistant to heat, sunlight, and water. Unfortunately, food is not safe either. PFAS is found in nonstick cookware as well as takeout food containers like pizza boxes and microwave popcorn bags. The PFAS content allows the packaging to resist oil and staining. They are dubbed forever chemicals as they are toxic and they are very difficult to break down. These chemicals are xenobiotic, meaning they are foreign to living organisms and they're not found in nature and are not supposed to be in living organisms. Unfortunately, these ubiquitous carcinogenic contaminants have been proven to cause serious health detriments and even death. In 1966, aboard the USS Forrestal aircraft carrier, there was a rocket accident that resulted in the deaths of 134 sailors and almost destroyed the carrier. After this horrific accident, a life-saving compound was produced that would extinguish fires and meet the needs that arise in military combat situations. AFFF, or aqueous film forming foam, was born. AFFF contains PFAS, and the military still uses AFFF. From that time forward, PFAS continued to be manufactured and used in applications that adapt to modern life in order to make things easy and more convenient. PFAS are literally everywhere due to contamination of the environment and being used in so many products for decades. PFAS are found in human blood, breast milk, umbilical cords of newborn babies, soil, drinking water, and they've even been found in the Arctic. On the Environmental Working Group website, they state that PFAS are in an enormous amount of consumer goods, and continued use has resulted in finding PFAS in water, soil, people, and in animals all around the world. Two of the most common PFAS are PFOA, which is polyfluoroactanoic acid, and PFOS, which is perfluoroctane sulfonate. They are both extremely stable and they are hydrophobic, meaning they are scared of water, or in scientific terms, they resist water, and they are also fully saturated with fluorine atoms, which makes them amphilic. This just means that the extremely electronegative fluorine is part of a water-soluble group that is attached to a water-insoluble hydrocarbon chain. Both PFOS and PFOA are eight-chain fluorinated substances. Polyfluoroctanoic acid is a surfactant, and surfactants lower the surface tension of water. Think of it this way. 
When you see rainwater beat up and roll off of a freshly waxed car when it rains, uh, surfactants lower tension, preventing water from settling, resulting in water rolling away. Perfluorooctane sulfonate is also a surfactant whose chemical properties reduce grease absorption. They're also used in firefighting foam and as a stain protector for fabrics. As I mentioned, they're deemed forever chemicals. This is because they rem remain in the environment for decades and they're extremely difficult to break down. On EmergingContaminants.eu, they have a fact sheet on PFOS and PFOA. They state that PFOS can be destroyed only after a temperature of at least 1100 degrees Celsius. If you think about it, this is perfect when put into a foam that's used to fight fires. The detriment here, however, is that this chemical is toxic and it can last in the environment and the body for years, causing significant health problems. The detriment of PFAS to the environment has been known and acknowledged and many of them are no longer in use and they're also being ramped down. However, alternative versions of PFAS that are just as dangerous are being used. A shorter PFAS chain limits the half-life of the compound. So what some manufacturers are doing is instead of making the long chain fluorinated compounds, the chains are limited to chains consisting of at least six uh, fluorinated bonds. Upon understanding the dangers of the long chains, the shorter ones were thought to be safer and more environmentally friendly. However, research has shown that this is not the case. On Beachopedia.org, there's an article by Balin Bennett called PFAS Chemicals. He states that shorter chains were thought to be safer as they would not break down to form PFOS and PFOA. He adds that they also were thought to not accumulate in animals and people and that they could be eliminated from the body while voiding, while having less of an impact on the environment. He ends with stating that the continued exposure defeats the purpose of having shorter chains. A good analogy for this would be instead of smoking a pack of cigarettes a day, you smoke half a pack a day. This is literally just as dangerous. As I had mentioned, the long chain PFAS have been phased out, but the United States still uses the shorter ones. On awwa.org, the American Water Works Association, they published a fact sheet on PFAS and their, on their website, and they state that as of August of 2019, the EPA allows over 600 different types of PFAS to be made or imported into the United States. Now that I've discussed what PFAS are, their uses, and a little history behind them, I will talk about their negative effects and what is being done to protect us from these forever chemicals. The dangers to humans and the environment, ailments associated with PFAS. PFAS have been linked to a myriad of health issues as these forever chemicals have found their way into the human body. They have contaminated the soil, drinking water, food, and can even be found in common household dust. PFAS can cause infertility, testicular cancer, low birth weight, and birth defects. On the U.S. National Library of Medic Medicine's website, there's an article by Terrapore and Oyang called Perfluoroalkyl Chemicals and Male Reproductive Health. Do PFOA and PFOS increase risk for male infertility? What they did was look at multiple epidemiological studies trying to study any link between PFAS and their detrimental effects on health. They state that rodents who were exposed to PFAS show changes in hormones like gonadotropin and testosterone. There was even a decrease in sperm production. Despite modern medicine and adequate access to health care, birth defects are more common than one may think. The CDC states that one in every 33 births has some kind of birth defect in the United States. That almost doesn't sound real, but sadly it's true. Uh, PFAS can be found in the blood, blood of the umbilical cord, as well as, the, as breast milk. And I believe that there is a direct correlation with the amount of birth defects and the potency of PFAS uh, contamination. 
During pregnancy and development, the mother is the primary source of nutrients, vitamins, and protection from pathogens and disease. Despite a mother doing her absolute best, the contamination of forever chemicals can contribute to birth defects in children. On the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, they state that lab animal studies have shown that PFAS cause birth defects, delayed development, and newborn death. Endocrine disruptions are dangerous and can lead to many other health issues resulting in cancer proliferation and even death. PFAS can cause these disruptions by interfering with normal processes as they can even mimic hormones causing adverse reactions. On endocrine.org, the Endocrine Society's website, they state that PFAS can mimic fatty acids and interfere with hormonal processes. What makes this so dangerous is that when hormones and glands are interfered with by an unknown chemical, the endocrine system tries to do its best to function normally as the cell cycle operates, cells will get copied, and if repairs are needed, it happens and apoptosis also takes place. Disruption from PFAS can interfere with the endocrine system to the point where not enough hormones are produced. This can result in detriments that severely hamper fertility, and in women it can induce early onset of menopause. On the Oxford Academic website, there is an article by Ding, Harlow, Randolph, and others called Perfluoroalkyl and Polyfluoroalkyl Substances and Their Effects on the Ovary. They gathered studies focusing on ovarian disorders in relation to PFAS. They state that exposure to PFAS reduces ovarian hormone production, causing irregular menstrual cycles and early onset of menopause. I wanted to take a moment to say thank you for supporting the podcast. The Living Healthy Podcast is listed on many platforms, including Anchor, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Bullhorn, and many others. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest. And don't forget to check out the Living Healthy Podcast channel on YouTube. Also, if you have any questions or would like me to discuss a particular topic or you'd like to be a guest on the show, please contact me at livinghealthylivinghealthy at gmail.com. PFAS exposure can lead to abnormalities such as tumors, and the fact that they're found everywhere makes them that much more dangerous. On the NCBI website, there's a research study that was just published in May of 2020. The article is by Blystone, Herbert, and Janardhan. The article is called NTP Technical Report on the Toxicology and Carcinogenesis Studies of Perfluoroactanoic Acid Administered in Feed to Sprog Dolly Rats. They state that two two-year feed studies concluded that male rats develop benign tumors in their pancreas while female rats develop them in their thyroid and kidneys while exposed to PFAS. PFAS have been found to be carcinogenic, and the continued buildup in the body through repeated environmental exposure continues to contribute to cancer cases. Every year, there are hundreds of thousands of cancer cases being diagnosed around the world. Most will say that due to modern medicine allowing people to live longer, that this is the primary cause. Their tenet is that because you live longer, you're around longer, and that puts you at risk for cancer. I don't believe that's completely true. I believe it's more of the things like PFAS that we're exposed to and continue to be exposed to, and that is what puts us at risk. On the MDPI website, there is an article called Application of the Key Characteristics of Carcinogens to Per- and Polyfluoral Alkyl Substances by Temkin, Hosfer, Andrews, and several others. They studied data of epidemiological studies and concluded that PFAS promotes oxidation, suppresses the immune system, triggers cancer cells, and cancer cell production. PFAS can also affect men by causing testicular cancer. Barry, Winquist, and Steenland published an article on PubMed.gov called 
perfluorooctanoic acid exposures and incident cancers among adults living near a chemical plant. They studied a community of adults who lived near a chemical plant and found 21 different types of cancers. They concluded that their research showed that the PFAS detected in the population was commensurate with kidney and testicular cancer. Essentially, what they're saying is that of the 21 types of cancers found, kidney and testicular cancer were the two most common, and both were in relation to higher amounts of PFAS. PFAS can also affect your total serum cholesterol levels. HDL is your good cholesterol and LDL is your bad cholesterol. It's proven that increasing HDL and lowering LDL is a proven and effective way to decrease your chances of having a heart attack and improving your overall cardiovascular health. However, PFAS exposure has been linked to increasing total cholesterol. Increasing your total cholesterol is detrimental to cardiovascular health, resulting in some ailments such as hypertension, a cerebral vascular accident, and myocardial infarction. On the Public Library of Sciences website, there's an article by Erickson, Nielsen, McLaughlin, and several others called Association Between Plasma PFOA and PFOS Levels and Total Cholesterol in a Middle-Aged Danish Population. They conducted a cross-sectional study where blood samples were taken from a population over a four-year period. They concluded a definite association between PFAS exposure and total cholesterol. PFAS have been found to impair the immune system and a vaccine's ability to be effective. This is ever so important during the coronavirus pandemic as the push for vaccinations continue all across the world. Rapazzo, Kaufman, and Hines published an article called Exposure to Perfluorinated Alkyl Substances and Health Outcomes in Children, a Systematic Review of the Epidemiologic Literature. Their evidence concluded that PFAS has the ability to interfere with antibody response to vaccines and cause other health problems. On PFASproject.com, there's an article by Rebecca Trager called PFAS Exposure Found to Increase Risk of Severe COVID-19. She states that scientific studies have now linked high levels of PFAS with immune suppression and impairment of vaccine efficacy. The CDC is currently investigating whether or not there is a relationship between PFAS and COVID-19 infection. In November of 2020, former director of the CDC, Robert Redfield, responded to U.S. Representative Daniel T. Kildee, who had asked about this during the early stages of the pandemic. Kildee was essentially told that the CDC is monitoring and researching to see if there is any correlation. Given how PFAS affects the body and that there are so many breakthrough COVID-19 cases of fully vaccinated people, I would assume that PFAS exposure has some role to play in this. Forever chemicals and where they are found. Forever chemicals are prominent in drinking water and it gets in there by water runoff, manufacturing, and by seeping into water from the soil. Even though the longer chains of PFAS are no longer made, the shorter chains, as I mentioned, are just as dangerous and they're being put in place of these longer chains. Uh, PFAS are most common in drinking water of residents who live near where these chemicals are being made, as well as military bases and firefighter training facilities. PFAS find their way into fish through water contamination, and this can be dangerous not only for fish and wildlife, but a threat is posed to humans when we eat fish. There's an article on ScienceDirect.com by Fair, Wolf, White, and several others called perfluoroalkyl substances in edible fish species from Charleston Harbor and tributaries, South Carolina, United States, exposure and risk assessment. They tested fish and found 11 types of PFAS, with PFOS being the most predominant. They also state that 83% of fish had levels that exceeded the safety levels recommended by the EPA. 
Awareness of PFAS. Information about PFAS is becoming more widespread, not only because of lawsuits, but, but because of going green and awareness of protecting the environment and climate change. In this, as with all things regarding public safety, there's an acceptable limit that has been set by the government. The EPA has set a health advisory. This is a level of 70 parts per trillion of PFAS. Health advisories are non-enforceable. They're just a recommendation by the federal government on what they deem to be safe. That being said, every state has its own rules and regulations that they go by. On duke.edu, they have a PFAS fact sheet and they explain that PFAS levels are enforced by the state. As an example, PFOA standards for New Jersey are 14 parts per trillion. New Hampshire is 12 PPT. Michigan is 8 PPT. And New York has 10 PPT. These standards are as of June 3rd of 2020. There have been numerous reports stating that PFAS are more prevalent and are at a higher concentration than initially believed. On the Environmental Working Group's website, there's an article by Evans, Andrews, Stolber, and Nadenko called PFAS Contamination of Drinking Water, Far More Prevalent Than Previously Reported. They collected water samples from 44 places within 31 states. The highest levels were in Miami, Philadelphia, New Jersey, and New York. Seattle had the lowest contamination at 1 ppt, and North Carolina had the highest at 186 ppt. They also state that PFAS was found in rainwater. What has been done to lessen the impact of PFAS? The fortunate thing is that, as I mentioned earlier, is that the long chains are no longer made, and the shorter chains have a shorter half-life, which is good. But what makes it bad is that the continued exposure negates the benefit of producing shorter uh, chains of PFAS. The Safe Water Drinking Act of 1974 regulates drinking water contaminants, but currently there are no regulations for PFAS, only the health advisory by the EPA. For now, state regulations are how the PFAS are being regulated and enforced. Ways to limit your exposure. It almost seems discouraging that there may be no way to protect ourselves from PFAS, given that they're ubiquitous and are very hard to break down. You may not be able to completely eliminate your exposure, but you can reduce it the best way you can by executing some simple methods. Avoid nonstick cookware. Buy a good stainless steel cookware set or even a cast iron uh, set of pots and pans. To alleviate cleanup, you can put a small amount of water in the pot or pan and place it on the stove on a low heat for a couple of minutes. This will cause the stuck on food to heat up a bit and the water will not allow it to stick. Avoid microwave popcorn. Try not to eat out or eat out less often. Ordering food to be delivered is normal and fun, especially if you're kicking back with the family on movie night or whatnot. Uh, especially now amid the uh, pandemic, you should not go anywhere unless you really have to. Also, you can make a lot of foods at home that you would normally order out. You can make hamburgers and fries, uh, chicken sandwiches and pizza, and avoid you know, being exposed to the PFAS containers. Now, I know that those may not be the healthiest food choices, especially on a podcast centered around health. I listed those foods because those are the most common foods that use PFAS material to package them. If you drink tap water, then you can use a filter to help cut down or eliminate your exposure. I've seen mixed things about water filters online. Some say it can filter out PFAS, while others say no. I advise researching the filter you're interested in and try to find out all you can if you want to drink tap water. You may even want to contact the manufacturer of the filter um, to get more in-depth answers. 
or even your um, your local city water department as well to get some information. For those thinking bottled water may be the answer, as with tap water, there is no legal enforcement on the amount of PFAS. So although bottled water is on average less acidic, cleaner, and better tasting than tap water, it is not regulated for PFAS. You can avoid stain resistant carpeting and stain resistant drapes, curtains, etc. Just keep some club soda on hand if you spill something to help take care of the, uh, the spills. The benefit of lessening your exposure is better than having a carpet that is hard to stain. Also, since PFAS can accumulate in household dust, it's important to try to vacuum often. And if you have wood floors and a vacuum with a floor setting, you can vacuum the floor to avoid uh, accumulation. Keep in mind, to dust often and since the pandemic people have had a lot more access to masks make sure to wear one if you're dusting around the home just for your safety you can stray from raincoats and rain boots and galoshes uh, i'm torn when it comes to am umbrellas because they're very necessary especially if you live somewhere where it rains a lot uh, you can also avoid waterproof makeup Reapplying your makeup is a better alternative than exposing yourself to PFAS. And if anything has fluoro in the ingredients, it's your best bet to assume that whatever it is, it contains PFAS. Some dental floss brands contain perfluorohexane sulfonic acid. This is a PFAS compound, which should be avoided. I am putting some links in the description of this podcast about additional information in case you're interested. It's succinct information on PFOS and PFOA. It's from uh, Cal one link rather is from California.gov um, Proposition 65 regarding uh, PFOS, and the other link is from the CDC regarding PFOA. I'm not being paid to mention these links or anything. I just feel that. The information um, upon me viewing it, it was very good, it was researched, and it was trustworthy. So I'm passing on that information to you in the event you're interested. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of the Living Healthy Podcast. I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank you for your support, and I'll see you next time. And remember, living healthy creates a better you.